Pippa Hallis, it is extraordinary to have you here with me. Thank you for joining me on Business Not As Usual. How are you today? I'm very well, very well. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. The queen of positivity through some very tricky and turbulent times. Tell me a bit about you and your background. So um, I guess I'm a, a CEO and a mum and um, a wife and a friend and a sister and all those things. But my journey, um, I grew up in a in a family, around a family business my whole life. Um, Ella Bache is my great aunt. And um, so definitely, you know, typical family business um, story where we always had conversations at the dinner table and life was all about um, a wonderful family um, experience and childhood, but always seeing what you, you know, your family was doing. I guess for me, uh, I left school, went to university and kind of went, you know, I need to have my own adventure. And so I stepped into um, corporate advertising and did that for about 10 years, 10 to 12 years here in Sydney, uh, London and Paris, and then decided, um, you know, in my early 30s to, to jump ship and, and try the family business. Amazing, and what an extraordinary business it is. 150 franchisees now? We do, we've got about 150 stores across Australia. Um, we also sell through David Jones, and we have done since 1954, so long, long relationship there. Um, we also um, have a, I guess, an undergraduate uh, college, so uh, we're a private provider, so we've got about 100, uh, 400 students across Australia who are learning to become um, beauty therapists, and we also run a, a strong and growing e-com business, especially at the moment. And we manufacture our products and create a lot of our products here in here in Sydney. So we do a lot. We do a lot. You sure do. And I'm fascinated, particularly at this time, to talk to you about what is traditionally a very bricks and mortar based business and how through COVID and all these turbulent, uncertain times, how you've managed to digitize a lot of that. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the front end of the business, so what consumers and customers see, mm -hmm. and then also the back end, so supply chain, additional revenue streams, how you've pivoted and adapted. So if we kick off with the front end, I think that'll be really fascinating to a lot of people. So can you just talk to me on a day-to-day -day basis, what mm -hmm. it looks like, these 150 franchisees, which are essentially small businesses, what does that look like on an ordinary pre-COVID day? So um, on an ordinary pre-COVID day, you would find an Elabache store anywhere um, from Darwin to Hobart and everywhere in between. And approximately 70% of their revenues would be um, derived through a high touch experience. So predominantly facials, whether it's, you know, skin diagnosing um, a client, putting them on the, on the facial bed, massage and beauty. So it's very, very high touch. Um, we sell solutions. So we, we sell a solution, which is, um, I guess like a prescription, like a doctor, but it's it's human to human, so it's um it's it's a it's a very high touch experience. So COVID hits, you're given twelve hours or something, I think it was, to turn this entire business around. What do you do? So I mean, I still get quite emotional when I think about that time. But um, so the the twenty sixth of March this year. Um, we we had to shut down every single store across Australia. So, twelve hours prior, as you said, I was it was about eleven o'clock at night, and I was watching the television, and um, Scott Morrison announced all all beauty services had to shut um, the next day. And you know, my overwhelming feeling is the responsibility I have for not only my team, um, but also you know, all of our franchisees, their families and, and their staff. So thousands of people across Australia. Um, so I guess, what did I do? Um, you know, ironically, ironically, I'd written a book 12 months beforehand called Bold Moves. And um, so all I had playing over in my mind was, I've got to make a bold move. I've got to make a bold move. And um, so I had... I had read this article, I, I love reading different, you know, stories of businesses and case studies, and 
I had read about um, a department store, a high-end department store in China through a Harvard um, business case study and what they'd done, you know, a couple of months before um, to their business. And, and they, they literally, same situation, shut down of all high-touch services and bricks and mortar and they, they educated their team to step into their social channels and essentially use the only channel they had available to them, which was a di digital channel to, to sell products. So I kind of went, okay, we absolutely have to set this business up to do the same. So we had uh, 10 days to do that before um, the stores were shut down. So I worked with my team, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and an amazing, we've got an amazing development team, thankfully. And um, we created, um, I guess, virtual salons. So we rolled out 100 vir 150 virtual salons, ready to go for, to, to hand over to our franchisees. As soon as they shut their bricks and mortar door, they could open their virtual door. So that's exactly what we did. What an extraordinary example of leadership. I mean, how deep did you have to dig through that time to step up and lead, give your teams confidence and let them know that actually there was going to be another solution that could see them through? Look, I think, I think, you know, at a very, very pragmatic um, baseline, there was no other option. So I was just, you know, you're running on adrenaline and, you know, the option to do nothing in my mind was not an option. Um, I, so, you know, I just, we just, we just rallied and, and worked super hard and it's amazing what you can do when you, when you have, when your back's against the wall. So, um, you know, we launched this virtual platform to, all of our team, to all of our franchisees, also to all of our, our students. We had to pivot that whole education business as well. So it was just like a military precision of just, you know, going through step by step. Um, I think, you know, in hindsight, some of the things that I'm most proud of is, you know, the use of education and giving at this time. I think, um, you know, I, I quickly realized that it wasn't a time to sell, it was a time to give. So, and it, and that came back in spades. So we, we literally set up, um, every day we'd have an education session either for our franchisees to help them to learn how to run a digital business. Cause it's extremely different from, um, bricks and mortar business. And, you know, the, the younger generation absolutely got it. They got how to drive social media, link it to a sale, um, you know, consult people online, et cetera. But for, you know, people who are in their 60s and 70s, it's, it, it's a massive learning curve. Yeah, so talk to me a little bit about that. You've really got essentially a double-sided marketplace. You've got all your franchisees, essentially small business mm -hmm. owners, and then you've got all your customers. And they're That's used right. to high-touch in salon experiences and suddenly as you say you're having to educate people which I assume is both sides so when you talk about a hundred or so digital salons mm. what does that look like from an interface perspective sure. I want to go into an Ella Bache salon I now have to do it online what does that look like for me as a customer Great question. So, so I guess for a, as if you were a customer of Ella Bache Bondi, I'd just say, um, you would receive in your inbox a, an email that basically took you through to our virtual Bondi, Ella Bache Bondi Junction's virtual store. So you would be clicking through an EDM or you could, it could come up on your Instagram feed or, so, or Facebook feed. So it's a, I guess it's driving awareness at the top of the funnel and then, you know, making sure we manage that customer experience right down to the funnel. Um, what, we, what we wanted people to do was to uh, engage with Ella Bache Bondi online so keeping that customer connection through this time of shutdown or lockdown was so important so you could click into elabache bondi's virtual salon and elabache bondi you would you would um you would receive the same education advice and and skin care consultation from the same therapist and that was the whole idea it was it was a time when we believed connecting with people that you trusted um, was so important. So we kept, we wanted to keep those relationships going. You could also then get, you know, complimentary skincare advice, but also, um, you know, buy the product through Ella Bache Bondi as opposed to Ella Bache, you know, head office and such. So that revenue we gave to, to the franchisees. 
Amazing. And in terms of retention, customer retention through that time, did you notice that most people adapted and were happy to come along on the journey? Yeah, it's 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 really interesting. And again, you know, a big a big learning is I think if you've got a if you've got a brand people love and trust, they will follow you um, into different channels. So I think that's that's what we're finding, and a lot of retailers are finding at the moment is. I mean, you know, I guess you have to have a good experience. So, and it's got to be seamless. Um, otherwise, people, you know, don't won't won't come on that journey. But if you've got a brand they trust, especially at the moment, it's not a time to trial new things. Um, they will absolutely come on that journey with you in the digital channel, you know, as well as in the in the bricks and mortar. So as things started to resume to normal, how did you continue to use digital tools to communicate with your customers? So I think some of the amazing things we learnt through this time, we've been able to take on the the new normal journey, I guess. So what we've learnt is our customers really, really engage with us in social channels um, when we use our therapists as influencers. So um, trying to get our therapists to step into their their bathrooms or their, you know, their, their beauty spaces and really educate the customers. So we've done a lot of training on um, how, how to teach the therapist to do that confidently. That's something we'll absolutely take on into the future. Um, another thing is to make sure, I think COVID has changed the way we operate businesses, um, and, and possibly forever. I think the whole, um, on and offline experience is, is, is not going to go back to what it was. So, you know, as we book restaurants, same same as as we book our our beauty or or facial services, that is all online. Um, how we absolutely, you know, control our hygiene and safety processes, that's something that we've had to take into the future. I think the challenge for for a business like ours um, nationally is that we've had so many different renditions of what an opening looks like. So as we all know, it's a it's a very um, premier state premier led decision. So um, when we've dealt with different states, such as even the Northern Territory, which opened um, after Queensland and WA, we were um, given the regulation that we couldn't. Um, do any services from the neck up. So all of a sudden we had headless customers that we had to learn to market to. And I, I say that, you know, with a smile on my face now, but it's, it's learning to run a business with so many different customer segments, so many different messages and taking those messages through the digital channels to drive people back into store and make sure they feel really, really safe. I think, you know, the the question of customer segmentation is really interesting as well because you've you suddenly got, you know, this this baby boomer generation who has probably a lot of um disposable income to spend because they're not on, you know, international flights or, you know, whatever they normally spend their money on. So you have to provide a really safe environment for them if they're going to engage with you um, to come in and have a personal service. So for business in general, as founders, CEOs, entrepreneurs, we're continuously pivoting, adapting, morphing, iterating, changing. Is there a silver lining from all of this in terms of it has turbocharged us into thinking differently, being more innovative and actually digitizing and looking between bricks and mortar and how we actually take things online? Is that a blessing in disguise for moving forward? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think I think it depends on the business that you run. I think there are there are winners and losers in this and, you know, to no fault of anyone's, you know, there are business models that are absolutely sustainable but not in a COVID time. So I don't want to say this, you know, sounding like it hasn't impacted people um, for the wrong reasons. It's, you know, there are, there are there are, it depends on where you are and what customer segment you're in. But I think all businesses for a long time have, have been on this transition of digital, you know, digitizing their business. And Australia has been a bit, you know, behind the eight ball as such. So, you know, some of those things have been awesome and they will not go back to what they were. I think digital is one aspect. I think, you know, being a, a leader of any business, um, the question the main question is how do you lead and run a business with so much uncertainty because, you know, we don't have history to, to you know, pull on it at this time. Um, and I think the only thing that 
that I would you know suggest is that you just have to do so many so many different scenario plans in all this you know is it up is it down what does that mean for cash what does that mean for our people um you know there you just have to manage with scenario planning and this is the perfect segue because the next piece I want to talk to you about is kind of the back end under the hood, you know, supply chain, revenue streams, forecasting. So let's dig into that a little bit. I mean, we're talking about customers, we're talking about your franchisees or essentially small business owners. What did it look like from a supply chain perspective? I mean, do you have products coming in from China or overseas? So our, our supply chains, um, we probably make about 50% of our products um, in Sydney. And so, but you, you know, so that means raw materials from everywhere. So you, we, we've got that um, bucket of products and then we've got some products we bring in in, in big, um, you know, blue plastic tubs from, from South France, um, what we call bulks. So, and then we have some packaging that comes from China. So it's, um, it's a very complex supply chain. Um, so we, we've been managing the complexities of, and the impacts of um, COVID-19 since January. So obviously when China kind of went into, went into shut down, um, we had to start managing those supply chains. I guess in terms of Europe, I feel I feel like I've been following COVID around the world. So we we have these beautiful um, glass jars that we um, import from Italy. So we had China, then Italy, <laughs> and then and then the south of France. So I guess the you know the whole forecasting and um, planning cycle is changed. I think. Um, you know, us like many many retailers. You know, going into into March this year, we we kind of went. We have to protect our cash. What does that mean for you know buying buying products and inventory, etc. So we started to to forecast down, um, but then we we quickly realised that you know life isn't wasn't as bad as we'd forecasted. So then we you know had to make sure we had enough inventory coming in on um, planes or boats from from all over the world I think the the challenge has been balancing you know those revenue forecasts those cash forecasts and then obviously the supply chains and we're we're still very much dealing with with that um, through 2020 in terms of you know we've got wharfy strikes here in in Sydney and um it's yeah. It adds, you know, sometimes four to six weeks lead times on on everything. So it's it's challenging. Thank you for shedding some light on that. I think it's really really important. Can we talk a bit about additional revenue streams? Because you've obviously had to change that a little bit, reforecast. How did what did that look like? Yeah. So I mean, uh, I guess remembering the biggest impact on our business has been a government enforced lockdowns. So bricks and mortar shut down. Um, and so if you look at our business profile um, in February this year, our e-com channel was about 8 9% of our business and it's now sitting at about 21% of our business. So um, no surprises, the digital channels are the winners um, out of all this when, you're, when you've been forced to shut your bricks and mortar down. Look, where, where that will end up, you know, it's anyone's guess, but certainly I think what we've seen is when we when we open um, a state or a, an area where we have a bricks and mortar salon, the the digital starts to come off a little bit, but not back to where it was. So it's it's just changing the channel profile. It's also changing, I think, the mix of products people buy. I mean, we had this we had this amazing um, example of you know when people. Um, went to security and safety and cleanliness, our cleansers just went off the charts. So it's it's kind of managing your channel mix, but it's managing your product mix as well. And then you've got the whole sustainability, you know, question mark around, you know, a lot of industries at the moment and making sure that, that things are clean. You know, people are loving Australian made products at the moment, which is fantastic. Um, and they're, and they're, they're engaging in different products as, as we as we move through these times. So the increase in people spending digitally is interesting. Has that actually helped some of your salons who may have potentially been geographically prohibitive to some areas? Is their reach getting broader? 
Um, look, I think I, I, I don't want to say that our digital business is is taking away from our bricks and mortar. I think you know we've we've seen our bricks and mortar um, once our stores have reopened absolutely grow as well because people um, have been locked inside. You know, you've probably seen all the memes on social media. You know, the first thing people want to do is make themselves feel feel good and look good again. So we've we've absolutely seen a huge spike in our um, in our revenues in our bricks and mortar when when our stores have reopened. I think we've also been the beneficiaries in our bricks and mortar as well as online um, with all this stimulus and cash running through the economy. So people have money to spend at the moment. I'm not sure what that will look like in March next year when all the stimulus um, comes out of the economy. Um, But I think the government's done a good job in, in stimulating the demand, whether it's, you know, it doesn't matter what channel it is. Talk to me about any other unexpected complexities because I think people think, oh yeah, COVID and then supply chain issues, but then there's everyday issues like strikes on the wharves and things like that. Is there anything unexpected in 2020 that really came at you on top of all of that and how did you deal with it? I think it goes back to um, the question of engagement. I think, you know, for myself and I think many leaders, it's been how do you engage with your teams and and probably more so than ever, make sure they're, they're motivated and happy and their mental health is okay when they're working at home with so much complexity in their life. Um, so I think we when we were all working on Zoom, it was a very hard, it's a very hard medium um, to, to engage and to, to have a really collaborative, open relationship with your team. And I, I really felt that, you know, it was, it was kind of like the person leading the meeting was very much speaking and everyone else was kind of listening. So to drive that engagement um, and, and make sure everyone was happy and healthy during lockdown was, was you know, something I had to solve and was, was quite hard. Um, we then kind of went to, to post lockdown, certainly in New South Wales, and the question around, you know, what does flexible working look like? Everyone's proven that they can work from home and be trusted and all these things that um, quite possibly, you know, companies didn't didn't believe before and everyone had proven that so you know what does the whole workplace look like going forward and and so we landed um we landed in a place in a hybrid model where we we really believe that certainly for our business because it is a creative business that we need to we needed to create a space where people could come together twice a week and and to you know share ideas and collaborate and get dressed up there's there's something to be said about getting dressed up and putting makeup on and doing your hair and all those really basic things now talk to me about your own rituals and routines because I know your hubby is also in the business and yes. you're a mum yes. so you've all been working at home through this time yes 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 what has that looked like and how have you kept sane and what have you done for your own mental mental and physical well-being so I think I always had this mantra which um got completely smashed apart with covid I always said to people yeah you can be a mom and you know be a business owner or leader at um, at the same time, just not in the same space. So all of a sudden my world <laughs> just got turned upside down and and our house was never a house that was set up for us to run a business from. So um, probably it looked as chaotic as most other people's houses. You know, we had, I've got a, a four-year-old and a seven-year-old, so pretty little people. Um, and they were they were being homeschooled on the dining room table. Um, and I would go into the bedroom and literally work off a chest of drawers. So I would kind of go, bye, have a great day at school. I'll just be in head office um, up the corridor. So that's what our life looked like. In terms of my husband, um, he's one of these people that talks on the phone a lot all day. So I just kind of went, you're going to have to go somewhere. I'm not sure where you're going to go, but you know, it's not going to be possible for all of us to be in this space all together. So we, we fortunately, you know, tag team and just went into the office, um, when no one else was in there and thankfully had that space to, to draw back on. Thank you. I think that's pretty reassuring for so many people watching this who 
think, well, Pippa's, you know, this amazing big CEO. And Pippa also was working from the top of her chest of drawers from her bedroom. So thank you for sharing. (laughs) And had technology issues and mobile phone reception issues and sitting in my car trying to do these calls at all. Yeah, so it's, it's happened to all of us. So in terms of your team through this time, was there anything that you did to support them, particularly around rituals, routines, disciplines and mental health to, to really support them from working from home? Look, I think it was just, it just came back to the basic setting of structure and routine each week. I think, you know, like, like many people, we had to double down on the number of um, huddles we had with our teams and, and make sure they were shorter. I mean, no one can sit on a Zoom call for two hours. So we, we just changed the way we connected. So we, we do a, you know, half an hour Monday morning, then Wednesday, then Friday, Um, we also ran educational and I guess tried to make it fun. One of the things I, I quickly learned was everyone was working so hard, um, particularly the first, you know, month or two when, when all this happened, we lost that sense of fun and we lost that sense of let's just meet at, you know, the table and have a drink and a chat. So we had to bring that back into, into our world as well and, and make sure we took half an hour out on a Thursday afternoon or Friday afternoon and did, I don't know, a silly online quiz or, or just, just got to know each other more. I think, um, one of the things I, I like to do with my team is we always start our weekly meetings with a personal question. So it might, it just, it just engages everyone on a personal level as, as opposed to just going into a transactional list of, of tasks. You came on board as CEO of Alabashe, I think just before the GFC hit. I did. Lucky you. Lucky Have- me. <laughs> awesome. Have you noticed big differences between that time and COVID? Are there similarities, differences, different ways you've had to lead? It's a good question. I think I was different. Obviously, back then I was, I was all of thirty-one too, so I was quite naive to you know the world um, of running a business. I think for me, um, it's really interesting. Like I, I draw on my you know the generations who came before me and you know, your values at the end of the day and what you do value. And I think those are, those are no different. And, you know, I get inspired by the fact that Elabashe started Elabashe in World War II or just, just post-World War II. So it was a, it was a, it was a time of complete disruption. And um, I, I get motivated by the fact if she can do it, I can do it as well. I think it, the crisis we're facing now is obviously not just a financial crisis. So it's, you know, it's a very different set of um, complexities. But I do think, it, you know, when, when things get really tough, um, one, of my, one of the mantras my dad always taught me was, you know, just come back to basics, just go back to basics and keep it simple and just, you know, just hold tight on your values and make sure that whatever you do today you're not going to regret in the future. Beautiful and very pertinent advice. So who do you turn to or what do you turn to to inspire you? Yeah, I think a couple of things. I think, um, you know, going back to going back to the, um, the theme of, you know, what anchors you in your life, I think, um, you know, for me it's the daily rituals of um, putting my feet in the ocean, jumping in the ocean, um, you know, kicking a soccer ball around on the beach, just having having those um, back to basic moments, I guess, in nature. Um, I think what inspires me is is learning and reading and 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 being open and curious. Still, I think if you can, and and we're so lucky these days. Like you can read a blog on your phone, and, and ten minutes you might learn something new every day. So I think certainly anchoring yourself, um, being curious making sure that you have a positive mindset. I feel like this has been a real battle of the mindsets and, um, you know, making sure you you surround yourself with people that, that keep you positive and you can trust and you can be vulnerable and you can be normal and all those, all those things. Yeah, I think that's extraordinary advice. And are there any other incredible businesses or people that you've witnessed through this time doing things beyond the extraordinary? Um, look, I think there's a, there's a lot. I, 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 I belong to an amazing business group, which is a global, 
um, business group called YPO and it's for CEOs under under um, 50. And, you know, the, the, the enormous things that those guys have had to do, you know, in Australia and, and globally. And, and I think it's, uh, you know, what comes to mind is, you know, a friend of mine who runs a, a really big business in, in Beirut. So they've dealt with COVID. They've dealt with the Civil War. They've dealt with that explosion and, you know, so I, I, I sit back and I hear these stories and I, I feel so fortunate and grateful that we are in Australia and we can go for a swim if we want and a walk. Um, but I think it's just giving back. I think, you know, in these moments, there are always people worse off than you. And, you know, there are, there are just little things that you just got to keep, go- keep going in your life and whether it's, you know, a cleaner that you can keep paying or whether it's, I don't know, your local coffee guy you can keep paying. Just all those things make a big difference to everyone's lives. So just a small question, what's next for Ella Bache? We're not going to go back to what we were before. You know, life is going to be um, a new normal. People's behaviours are going to change. Our life's going to change. And so, so too that does the business have to change. So, you know, of course, the di- dub- doubling down on digital, that's a no-brainer. I think, you know, looking at our bricks and mortar um, business, you, you know, I, I get excited because it's kind of like the, the rebirth of the high street, for example, all these wonderful, you know, local um, shopping districts that, that have had new life bred into them, the regional towns. So I think for us it's... It's growing, but it's growing in a different way. And I think CBD locations, it's going to take a long time for them to come back. Um, so that's that's kind of our distribution. Um, we will probably do more in the home, so stay tuned. Um, and we are likely to continue on our, I guess, sustainability mission and making sure that our products, you know, we've been working for a number of years, for example, with with hemp from Byron Bay and, you know, just some awesome Australian products and, and skincare that, that um, you know, drive skin results and, and different ways of working. Our head off is going to look completely different to, in the future to what it did, you know, in the past. So that's exciting. Amazing. Any parting words of wisdom that you would like to share? I Look, I think for me, you know, living life with so much uncertainty is going to continue in the future. So it's it's just grounding yourself with those moments of happiness. It doesn't matter what size business you're running. It's still, you know, you're still running and you're still learning. And as long as you can anchor yourself each day and continue to learn, then that's all, all we can do, I think. Pippa Hallis, thank you so much for joining me. You are full of wisdom and so much. You are so selfless. I really, really appreciate having you with us on Business Not As Usual. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. I really appreciate the time. Thank you. Stay on the line. Pippa and I will be here to answer any questions you have.